In this video, we'll take on uh, another piece of financial markets jargon, the yield curve. Now, this is just an introduction. It's a beginner's guide, if you like. So we're not going to go uh, rocket scientist on this one. But what are yield curves? Who uses them? Uh, and what do they tell you? Now, essentially, a yield curve does what it says on the tin for bonds. So it's some way of looking at the relationship between bond yields. And that's something we look at in a couple of other videos, uh, bond basics and uh, further bond basics. Uh, so I won't be talking much about that today. Uh, so it looks at yields and their relationship over time for similar groups of bonds. And essentially, it can be a way of reading what the bond market is thinking about the economic climate on a graph. It's not foolproof, but that's one of the ways it's used. It's a kind of snapshot of what bond markets think um, about the economic environment and what might be about to happen next. Okay, so how does that work? Well, in a nutshell, um, a typical curve is, is built on a, on a graph. So we're gonna have two axes, let's say, like most graphs do, um, time and yield. Now, I should just stress, yield curves look at what's called the total yield on bonds. So when you look up a bond price in say the FT, you'll find there's a column with FY, flat yield, income yield. That's not the one we're talking about here. That just looks at the income return on a bond. We're looking at what's called the yield to maturity here. That's the total yield taking account of both income and any capital gain or loss arising on the bond between now and redemption. And as I say, if that all sounds a bit Icelandic to you, then take a look at my Bond Basics videos first and then come back to this one. Okay, so um, yield is what I'll call yield to maturity. Sadly, in financial markets, nothing has one name where two will do. So this one is also known as the gross redemption yield. So you might see it flagged up as GRY. But anyway, we're looking at the total yield not just the income yield. Now, basically, what we're saying is, what is the relationship for similar types of bonds? So typically on a yield curve, you will look at, say, gilts, you know, or you might look at corporate bonds of a certain subset, so um, high rated, for example. So we're saying for similar types of bonds, we don't just want to sort of pepper this with any sort of bond to start with. So let's say uh, government bonds, what sort of relationship are we seeing at the moment? In other words, um, IOUs issued by the government have different maturities. Um, some will be uh, paid off in, say, a year's time, some in five years' time, some in 20 or 30 years' time. And what sort of return are investors demanding for the risk of investing with the government over time? And here's the point about a yield curve. The assumption is that if you invest with the British government or the American government, um, default risk is close to zero. You're not expecting the government to go bust. So it doesn't matter what you buy, one year, five year, 10 year, 20 year, you're gonna get your money back. So the question then is what reward do you want for tying your money up for longer? That's really what we're sort of getting at as a basic picture of a yield curve. And normally what you find is yield curves are upward sloping. So they might look a little bit like that. It can be any shape in theory, uh, and that one's known as normal or upward sloping. And what it's suggesting is this, if that's sort of um, two years, that's 10 years, and that's um, you know, 20 years for argument's sake, or even 30, what it's suggesting is that broadly speaking, over time, investors are asking for a higher yield for locking their money up for longer. Well, that makes sort of logical sense. So you're saying that if I'm only going to give my money to the government for a couple of years, I'll accept a relatively low yield. And as I lock my money up for longer and longer and longer, um, I'm expecting a gradually increasing yield. So that would seem to make some commercial sense, let's say. So why is it the yield curves are not always that shape? 
Well, we'll address that in just a moment, but there's something else you can do with yield curves. They can be used um, for comparing the yields on, say, something really, really safe, government bonds, with, let's say, uh, corporate bonds. Now, you'd normally expect the yield on a corporate bond to be that little bit higher. Uh, there is some default risk there, for example. Take a Tesco uh, or even an HSBC. They're probably not going to go bust, but they might. So, if you were to plot, say, corporate bonds over the top, you might find the line is slightly higher. Wouldn't necessarily be exactly like that as a sort of mirror image, but you get the idea. The line might be slightly higher, and the gap, so in other words, the expected return is that little bit higher for both short, medium, and long dated bonds. And the gap, just another bit of jargon, that gap there is known as a spread. So I know this isn't terribly scientific, I'm not putting many numbers up today, but just more jargon really to be aware of when people talk about um, a corporate bond having a spread over gilts. What they're saying is uh, for a particular maturity, perhaps uh, you know, a, a mid-length bond, for example, around the sort of 10-year mark, um, there is a gap between the return investors demand for investing in, say, Tesco, as opposed to investing in the nearest equivalent government bond. So, essentially, that spread is normally positive, and it can widen or narrow. This is really just jargon. Now, that you might you might have guessed correctly, just suggests that um, this can change. So um, as the perception of relative risk, for example, between Tesco and the UK government changes, so that gap can either narrow or widen. Um, so that's just another piece of jargon to be aware of. In the US, the benchmark, if you like, is a, is a treasury. Uh, it's the equivalent to a gilt in the UK. So you hear uh, American bonds being talked about in terms of the spread over treasuries. Okay, the other point to bear in mind, of course, is that this could be, for example, the US, and that could be, um, for argument's sake, some Eurozone country in a little bit of trouble, Greece. Quite a big spread at the moment between those two, because the US government is considered relatively safe, discounting the fact that S&P put a warning on it recently, whereas Greece is obviously in a bit of trouble. So the gap there between Greek bonds and US bonds with similar, similar characteristics is a very wide one at the moment. Okay, so there's sort of one use of yield curves. Now, to go back to my point about the shape, is it always upward sloping? And the answer is no, not necessarily. So just be aware that the bond vigilantes sometimes signal their disquiet with the market as follows. An inverted yield curve, well it wouldn't, it, I mean, this, this is a simplification, it wouldn't be a straight line like that, but you get the idea. An inverted yield curve is one where essentially the pattern is downwards over time. So left to right, yields appear to be falling. And that intuitively doesn't at first glance make much sense. So you're, so you're actually saying that what's happening is for locking my money up with say the government for 20 years, I'm being offered what a lower yield than just for two. What's going on there? Well, sometimes a yield curve moving from normal into inverted shape, if you like, and obviously it can, it can go virtually flat in the middle, is a sign of trouble. It's the bond market signaling trouble. Because this is what tends to happen when the economy, let's say the US or the UK economy, gets into trouble, basically the expectation is that interest rates will be cut by central banks. And that's one of the things that can be signalled. Perhaps we're looking at interest rate cuts. The bond markets are expecting interest rate cuts. Now, if that's the case, all of a sudden people will look at long dated bonds and think, hmm, okay, I can lock in to a long-dated government bond with a decent fixed coupon. Don't forget the coupons are always fixed. The yield, remember, that we're looking at here is a function of the coupon over the price, not just the coupon. So I can lock in to a long-term government bond with a decent coupon in an environment 
of falling interest rates. So central banks cutting, and that meaning that you know, my deposit in the bank earns less and less and less and less. So maybe suddenly I'm attracted by long-term government bonds because of the reasonably high fixed coupon. So I start buying them, which drives the price up and compresses the yield. Because don't forget, the yield is the return over the price. That's what a yield is. So if people start piling in to long-term government debt, price rises, yield gets squashed. And they're doing it because they're thinking, well, in an environment of central banks cutting interest rates, I want the high, fixed, relatively safe yield on a government bond. Okay, so almost I'm prepared to overlook the fact that I'm locking my money up for longer in the search for a decent coupon. There are other reasons too. That's, uh, that's just one, but that, that's one reason. Um, for example, when the yield curve did invert relatively recently, people also asked the question, is it a sign that the economy is in trouble, interest rate cuts coming up, or is it simply supply and demand? For example, if there are not many long-dated bonds around issued by the government, pension funds have a problem because they like to hold quite a few of them. So if there's a shortage of kilts, after all it is a supply and demand thing this the, after, uh, in operation after all, if there's a shortage of a particular gilt, say long dated, pension funds are going to tend to pile in, drive the price up and drive the yield down anyway. So there's no magic formula here. You can't say, you know, um, a low yield over here signals the bond vigilantes are pessimistic about the outlook. It may simply be that there isn't enough supply to meet demand at a certain part of the, of a certain part of the curve or in a certain part of the market. Um, and for that reason, you can get to the kinks. To suggest it's just a line like that is a bit of a simplification. You know, it might wobble a bit in certain places uh, to, to, to reflect that supply and demand imbalance. So, in a nutshell, yield curves, very common piece of jargon, uh, essentially, it gives you uh, a snapshot picture of what investors expect over time and the kind of yields they're demanding on, let's say, government bonds, although it can be constructed for other bonds, such as corporate bonds. Normal is upward sloping, and that simply reflects the fact that over time you tend to ask for a higher return. However, the whole thing can invert, and then you need to ask the question, why, and how long will it last? And finally, don't forget that Yield curves can be one way to read off what's called a spread. If you hear that piece of jargon being used, spread over treasuries, spread over gilts, it just means that there is a gap between a benchmark bond and the one that's being discussed. And depending on economic conditions, that gap can either widen or narrow.